I'm giving you a choice. Either put on these glasses or start eating that trash can. I already am eating from the trash can all the time. The name of this trash can is ideology. The material force of ideology makes me not see what I'm effectively eating. It's not only our reality which enslaves us. The tragedy of our predicament when we are within ideology is that when we think that we escape it into our dreams, at that point, we are within ideology. from 1988 is definitely one of the forgotten masterpieces of the Hollywood left. It tells the story of John Nada. Nada, of course, in Spanish means nothing, a pure subject deprived of all substantial content, a homeless worker in LA who, drifting around, one day enters into an abandoned church and finds there a strange box full of sunglasses. And when he put one of them on, walking along the LA streets, he discovers something weird. That these glasses function like critique of ideology glasses. They allow you to see the real message beneath all the propaganda, publicity, glitz, posters, and so on. You see a large publicity board telling you, have your holiday of a lifetime, and when you put the glasses on, you see just on the white background a gray inscription. We live, so we are told, in a post-ideological society. We are interpolated, that is to say, addressed by social authority, not as subjects who should do their duty, sacrifice themselves, but subjects of pleasures. Realize your true potential, be yourself, lead a satisfying life. When you put the glasses on, you see dictatorship in democracy. It's the invisible order which sustains your apparent freedom. The explanation for the existence of these strange ideology glasses is the standard story of the invasion of the body snatchers. Humanity is already under the control of aliens. Hey, buddy. You gonna pay for that or what? Look, buddy, I don't want no house today. Either pay for it or put it back. According to our common sense, we think that ideology is something blurring, confusing our straight view Ideology should be glasses which distort our view. And the critique of ideology should be the opposite, like you take off the glasses so that you can finally see the way things really are. This precisely, and here the pessimism of the film of They Live is well justified, this precisely is the ultimate illusion. Ideology is not simply imposed on ourselves. Ideology is our spontaneous relationship to 
our social world, how we perceive its meaning, and so on and so on. We, in a way, enjoy our ideology. All right. To step out of ideology, it hurts. It's a painful experience. You must force yourself to do it. This is rendered in a wonderful way with a further scene in the film where John Nada tries to force his best friend, John Armitage, to also put the glasses on. I don't want to fight you. Come on. I don't want to fight you. Stop it. No. And it's the weirdest scene in the film. The fight takes eight, nine minutes. Put on the glasses. It may appear irrational, because why does this guy reject so violently to put the glasses on? It is as if he is well aware that spontaneously he lives in a lie, that the glasses will make him see the truth, but that this truth can be painful, can shatter many of your uh, illusions. This is a paradox we have to accept. Oh, the glasses! Oh! Put them on! The extreme violence of liberation. You must be forced to be free. If you trust simply your spontaneous sense of well-being or whatever, you will never get free. What? Freedom hurts. The basic insight of psychoanalysis is to distinguish between enjoyment and simple pleasures. They are not the same. Enjoyment is precisely enjoyment in disturbed pleasure, even enjoyment in pain. And this excessive factor disturbs the apparently simple relationship between duty and pleasures. This is also a space where ideology up to, and especially religious ideology, operates. This brings me to maybe my favorite example, the great classical Hollywood film, The Sound of Music. We all know it's the story of a nun who is too alive with too much energy, ultimately sexual energy, to be constrained to the role of a nun. Oh, oh, Reverend Mother, I'm so sorry. I just couldn't help myself. The gates were open and the hills were beckoning, and before here. I... Here, I haven't summoned you here for apologies. Oh, please, Mother, do let me ask for forgiveness. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, step together. Now, so, step Mother up, Superior step sends up, her to the Von Trapp uh, family, uh, where she this... takes care of the children, under. Mm. <laughs> we'll have um, to practice. Do allow me, will you? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, of course, falls in love with the Baron von Trepp. And Maria gets too disturbed by it, cannot control it, returns to the <laughs> convent. Oh, there were times when we would look at each other. Oh, Mother, I could hardly breathe. Did you let him see how you felt? If I did, I didn't know it. That's what's been torturing me. I was there on God's errand. No wonder that in old communist Yugoslavia, where I saw this film for the first time, exactly this scene, or more precisely, the song which follows this strange hedonist, if you want, advice from the mother superior. Go back, seduce the guy, follow this path, do not betray your desire, Namely, the song which begins with Climb Every Mountain. The song which is an almost embarrassing display and affirmation of desire. These three minutes were censored. Climb every mountain, search high and low, follow every byway. I think the censor was a very intelligent man. He knew, as probably an atheist communist, where the power of attraction of Catholic religion resides. Till you find your dream, a dream 
if you read intelligent Catholic propagandists, and if you really try to discern what deal are they offering you, it's not to prohibit, in this case, sexual pleasures. It's a much more cynical contract, as it were, between the church as an institution and the believer troubled with, in this case, sexual desires. It is this hidden, obscene permission that you get. You are covered by the divine big other. You can do whatever you want. Enjoy. This obscene contract does not belong to Christianity as such. It belongs to Catholic Church as an institution. It is the logic of institution at its purest. This is again a key to the functioning of ideology. Not only the explicit message, renounce, suffer, and so on, but the true hidden message. Pretend to renounce and you can get it all. My psychoanalytic friends are telling me that typically today, patients who come to the analyst to resolve their problems feel guilty not because of excessive pleasures, not because they indulged in pleasures which go against their sense of duty or morality or whatsoever. On the contrary, they feel guilty for not enjoying enough, for not being able to enjoy. Oh my God, one is thirsty in the desert and what to drink but Coke, the perfect commodity. Why? It was already Marx who long ago emphasized that a commodity is never just a simple object that we buy and consume. A commodity is an object full of theological, even metaphysical niceties. Its presence always reflects an invisible transcendence. And the classical publicity for Coke quite openly refers to this absent, invisible quality. Coke is the real thing, or Coke, that's it. What is that it, the real thing? It's not just another positive property of Coke, something that can be described or uh, pinpointed through chemical analysis, is that mysterious something more. <laughs> the undescribable excess, which is the object cause of my desire. In our postmodern, however we call them, societies, we are obliged to enjoy. Enjoyment becomes a kind of a weird, perverted duty. The paradox of Coke is that you are thirsty, you drink it. But as everyone knows, the more you drink it, the more thirsty you get. A desire is never simply the desire for a certain thing. It's always also a desire for desire itself, a desire to continue to desire. Perhaps the ultimate horror of a desire is to be fully filled in met, so that I desire no longer. The ultimate melancholic experience is the experience of a loss of desire itself. It's not that in some return to an, a previous era of natural uh, consumation where 
we got rid of this excess and were only consuming for actual needs, like you were thirsty, you drank water, and so on. We cannot return to that. The excess is with us forever. So let's have a drink of Coke. It's getting warm. It's no longer the real Coke, and that's the problem. You know, this passage from sublime to excremental dimension. When it's cold, properly served, it has a certain attraction. All of a sudden, this can change into shit. It's the elementary dialectics of commodities. We are not talking about objective, factual properties of a commodity. We are talking only here about that elusive surplus. Kinder surprise egg, a quite astonishing commodity. The surprise of the kinder surprise egg is that this excessive object, the cause of your desire, is here materialized in the guise of an object, a plastic toy which fills in the inner void of the chocolate egg. The whole delicate balance is between these two dimensions. What you bought, the chocolate egg, and the surplus, probably made in some Chinese gulag or whatever, the surplus that you get for free. I don't think that the chocolate frame is here just to send you on a deeper voyage towards the inner treasure, the what Plato calls the agalma, which makes you a worthy person which makes a commodity the desirable commodity, I think it's the other way around. We should aim at the higher goal, the goal in the middle of an object, precisely in order to be able to enjoy the surface. This is what is the anti-metaphysical lesson which is difficult to accept. What does this famous ode to joy stand for? It's usually perceived as a kind of a ode to humanity as such, to the brotherhood and freedom of all people. And what strikes the eye here is the universal adaptability of this well-known melody. It can be used by political movements which are totally opposed to each other. In Nazi Germany, it was widely used to celebrate great public events. In Soviet Union, Beethoven was lionized and the Ode to Joy was performed almost as a kind of a communist song. In China, during the time of the Great Cultural Revolution, when almost all Western music was prohibited, the Ninth Symphony was accepted. It was allowed to play it as a piece of progressive bourgeois music. At the extreme right, in South Rhodesia, before it became Zimbabwe, it proclaimed independence to be able to postpone the abolishment of apartheid. There, for those couple of years of independent South Rhodesia, again, the melody of the Ode to Joy with changed lyrics, of course, was the anthem of the country. At the opposite end, when Abimael Guzman, Presidente Gonzalo, the leader of Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path, the extreme leftist guerrilla in Peru, when he was asked by a journalist which piece of music is his favorite, he claimed again Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy. 
When Germanish were still divided and their team was appearing together at Olympics, when one of the Germans won golden medal, again, Ode to Joy was played instead of either East or West German national anthem. And even now, today, Ode to Joy is the unofficial anthem of European Union. So it's truly that we can imagine a kind of a perverse scene of universal fraternity where Osama bin Laden is embracing President Bush, Saddam is embracing Fidel Castro, white racist is embracing Mao Zedong, and all together they sing Ode to Joy. It works. And this is how every ideology has to work. It's never just meaning. It always has to also work as an empty container, open to all possible meanings. It's, you know, that gut feeling that we feel when we experience something pathetic and we say, oh my God, I'm so moved, there is something so deep. But you never know what this depth is. It's a void. Uh, now, of course, there is a catch here. The catch is that, of course, this neutrality of a frame is never as neutral as it appears. Here, I think, the perspective of Alex from The Clockwork Orange enters. We were all feeling a bit shagged and fagged and fashed, it having been an evening of some small energy expenditure, oh, my brothers. So we got rid of the auto and stopped off at the Corova for a nightcap. Why is Alex, his ultimate cynical delinquent, the hero of Clockwork Orange, why is he so fascinated, overwhelmed, when he sees the lady singing Beethoven's Ode to Joy? And it was like for a moment, oh my brothers, some great bird had flown into the milk bar and I felt all the melancholy little hairs on my plot standing endwise, and the shivers crawling up like slow melancholy lizards, and then down again, because I knew what she sang. It was a bit from the glorious ninth by Ludwig van. Whenever an ideological text says all humanity unite in brotherhood, joy, and so on, you should always ask, Okay, 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 but are these all really all, or is someone excluded? I think Alex, the delinquent from Clockwork Orange, identifies with this place of exclusion. And the great genius of Beethoven is that he literally staged this exclusion. All of a sudden, the whole tone changes into a kind of a carnivalesque rhythm, it's no longer this sublime beauty. Excuse me, brother. I ordered this two weeks ago. Can you see if it's arrived yet, please? Just a minute. We hear this vulgar music precisely when Alex enters a shopping arcade and we can see from his movements that now he feels at home. He's like fish in the water. Pardon me, ladies. Beethoven is not a cheap celebrator of the brotherhood of humanity and so on. We are one big happy family enjoying freedom, dignity and so on. Enjoying that, are you, my darling? The first part, which is falsely celebrated today, you hear it in all official events, is clearly identified with Beethoven as ideology, and then the second part tells the true story of that which disturbs the official ideology and of the failure of the official ideology to constrain it, to tame it. This is why Beethoven was doing something which may appear difficult to do 
he was already in a purely musical work practicing critique of ideology. If the classical ideology functioned in the way designated by Marx in his nice formula from Capital Volume 1, Sie wissen das nicht, aber sie tun es. They don't know what they are doing, but they are nonetheless doing it. Cynical ideology functions in the mode of, I know very well what I'm doing, but I'm still nonetheless doing it. Yeah. This paradoxical constellation is staged in a beautiful way in the famous song Officer Krapke in Bernstein's and Sondheim's West Side Story. Hey, you! Who, me, Officer Krupke? Yeah, you! Give me one good reason for not dragging you down to the station house, you punk! Dear, kindly Sergeant Krupke, you gotta understand, it's just our bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunks. Golly, Moses, naturally we're punks. Gee, Officer Krupke, we're very upset. We never had the, the delinquent gang enacts a whole explanation, as a musical number, of course, of why they are delinquent. There is good, there is good, there is good, there is untapped good, like inside the worst of us is Addressing the police officer, Kratky, who is not there, but all is addressed to the police officer. That's a good story. Let me tell it to the world. Just tell it to the judge. So one of them adopts the position of a judge. Dear, kindly judge your honor, my parents treat me rough. With all their marijuana, they won't give me a puff. Then the psychological yes, explanation. He, he shouldn't be here. This boy don't need a couch, he needs a useful career. Society's played him a terrible trick. Unsociologically, he's sick. I am sick. We are sick. We are sick. The paradox here is, how can you know all this and still do it? This is the cynical functioning of ideology. They are never what they appear to be cynical, brutal delinquents. They always have a tiny private dream. This dream can be many things. It can even be something quite ordinary. Let's take the English riots of August 2011. The standard liberal explanation really sounds like a repetition of Officer Krapke song. We cannot just condemn these riots as uh, uh, as delinquent vandalism, you have to see how these people live in practically ghettos, isolated communities, no proper family life, no proper education, they don't even have a prospect of a regular employment. But this is not enough, because man is not simply a product of objective circumstances. We all have this margin of freedom, in deciding how we subjectivize these objective circumstances which, of course, determine us. How we react to them by constructing our own universe. The conservative solution is we need more police, we need courts which pass severe judgments. I think this solution is too simple. If one listened closely to some of David Cameron's statements, it looked as if, okay, they are beating people, burning houses, but the truly horrible thing is that they were taking objects without paying for them. No, that's the ultimate sin that we can imagine in a very limited way. Cameron was right. There was no ideological justification. It is the reaction of people who are totally caught into the predominant ideology, but have no ways to realize what this ideology demands of them. So it's a kind of a wild acting out within this ideological space of consumerism. Even if we are dealing with a apparently totally non-ideological brutality, I just want to burn houses to get objects it is the result of a very specific social and ideological constellation where big ideology 
striving for justice, equality, etc., disintegrates. The only functioning ideology is pure consumerism, and then no wonder what you get as a form of protest. Every violent acting out is a sign that there is something you are not able to put into works. Even the most brutal violence is the enacting of a certain symbolic deadlock. The great thing about the taxi driver is that it brings this brutal outburst of violence to its radical suicidal dimension. We are not dealing here with something which simply concerns the fragile psychology of a distorted person, what Travis in Taxi Driver is. It has something to do with ideology. Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore, who would not let... Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore. A man who stood up against the scum, the cunts, the dogs, the filth, the shit. Here is someone who stood up. In The Taxi Driver, Travis, the hero, is bothered by the young prostitute played by Jodie Foster. What bothers him are, of course, as is always the case, precisely his fantasies. Fantasies of her victimhood, of her hidden pleasures. And fantasies are not just a private matter of individuals. Fantasies are the central stuff our ideologies are made of. Don't look at him. Fantasy is, in psychoanalytic perspective, fundamentally a lie. Not a lie in the sense that it's just a fantasy, but not a reality, but a lie in the sense that Fantasy covers up a certain gap in consistency. When things are blurred, when we cannot really get to know things, fantasy provides an easy answer. The usual mode of fantasy is to construct a scene, not a scene where I get what I desire, but a scene in which I imagine myself as desired by others. Taxi Driver is an unacknowledged remake of perhaps the greatest of John Ford's westerns, his late classic, The Searchers. I take many scalps. In both films, the hero tries to save a young woman who is perceived as a victim of brutal abuse. In The Searchers, the young Natalie Wood was kidnapped and lived for a couple of years as the wife of an Indian chief. In Taxi Driver, the young Jodie Foster is controlled by a ruthless pimp. You walk out with those fucking creeps and lowlifes and degenerates out on the street and you sell your, sell your little pussy for nothing, man? For some lowlife pimp? Stands in a hall? I'm the, I'm square, you're the one that's square, man. I don't go screw and fuck with a bunch of killers and junkies the way you do. The task is always to save the perceived what victim. Are you from? But what really drives this violence of the hero is a deep suspicion that the victim is not simply a victim, that the victim effectively in a perverted way enjoys or participates in what appears as her victimhood so that, to put it very simply, she doesn't want to be redeemed. She resists it. Let's go home, Debbie. And this is the big 
problem, if I make an immediate jump to the political dimension, the big problem of American military interventions, especially so-called humanitarian interventions, from Iraq to already Vietnam uh, half a century ago, we try to help them, but what if they really did not want our help? The result of this debilitating deadlock can only be an outburst of violence. We do get, towards the end of the film, Travis exploding in a killing spree, killing the pimps, all the people around the young girl. Violence is never just abstract violence. It's a kind of brutal intervention in the real to cover up a certain impotence concerning what we may call cognitive mapping. You lack a clear picture of what's going on. Where are we? Exactly the same holds for the terrifying outburst of violence. Anders Bering Breiviks murderous spree in Oslo, exploding a bomb in front of the government building and then killing dozens of young members of the Social Democratic Party in an island close to Oslo. Many commentators try to dismiss this as a clear case of personal insanity. But I think Breivik's manifesto is well worth reading. It is palpably clear there how this violence that Breivik not only theorized about but also enacted is a reaction to the impenetrability and confusion of global capital. It's exactly like Travis Bickle's uh, killing spree at the end of the taxi driver. When he is there barely alive, he symbolically with his fingers points a gun at his own head. Clear sign that all this violence was basically suicidal. He was on the right path in a way, Travis in the taxi driver. You should have the outburst of violence and you should direct it at yourself but in a very specific way. At what in yourself chains you, ties you to the ruling ideology. In Steven Spielberg's Jaws, a shark starts to attack people on the beach. What does this attack mean? What does the shark stand for? There were different, even mutually exclusive answers to this question. On the one hand, some critics claim that obviously the shark stands for the foreign threat to ordinary Americans. The shark is a metaphor for either natural disaster, storms, or immigrants threatening United States citizens and so on. On the other hand, it's interesting to know that Fidel Castro, who loves the film, once said that for him it was obvious that Jaws is kind of a leftist Marxist film and that the shark is a metaphor for brutal, big capital exploiting ordinary Americans. So which is the right answer? I claim none of them and at the same time all of them. Ordinary Americans as ordinary people in all countries have a multitude of fears. We fear all kinds of things. We fear, maybe, immigrants or people whom we perceive as lower than ourselves, attacking us, robbing us. We fear people raping our children. We fear natural disasters, tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis. We fear corrupted politicians, 
We fear big companies which can basically do with us whatever they want. The function of the shark is to unite all these fears so that we can, in a way, trade all these fears for one fear alone. Smile, you son of a... In this way, our experience of reality gets much simpler. Why am I mentioning this? Because isn't it that for example, the most extreme case of ideology, maybe in the history of humanity, the Nazi, fascist, anti-Semitism, worked precisely in the same way. Imagine an ordinary German citizen in the late 20s, early 30s. His situation is, in an abstract way, the same as that of a small child. He's totally perplexed, social, Authority symbolic order is telling him you are a German worker, banker, whatever. But nothing functions. What does society want from him? Why is everything going wrong? The way he perceives the situation is that newspapers lie to him. He lost his work because of inflation. He lost all his uh, all, all his uh, money in the bank. Uh, he sees moral degradation and so on. So. What's the meaning of this all? The original fascist dream is to, of course, as a dream of every ideology, to have a cake and to eat it. As it was often pointed out, fascism is at its most elementary a conservative revolution. Revolution, economic development, modern industry, yes, but a revolution which would nonetheless maintain or even reassert a traditional hierarchical society. A society which is modern, efficient, but at the same time controlled by hierarchic values with no class or other antagonisms. Now, they have a problem here, the fascists, but antagonism, class struggle and other tensions is something inherent to capitalism. Modernization, industrialization, as we know from the history of capitalism, means disintegration of old, stable relations, it means social conflicts. Instability is the way capitalism functions. So how to solve this problem? Simple. You need to generate an ideological narrative which explains how things went wrong in a society, not as the result of the inherent tensions in the development of this society, but as the result of a foreign intruder. Things were okay till Jews penetrated our social body. The way to restore the health of our social body is to eliminate the Jews. It's the same operation as with the shark in Jaws. You have a multitude of fears, and this multiplicity of fears confuses you, like you, don't, you simply don't know what's the meaning of all this confusion. And you replace this confused multitude with one clear figure, the Jew, and everything becomes clear. The search for cuts in the social security provision to lone parent families in part spurred this report. The Social Security Department fears that the accelerating budget for single mothers on benefits could reach nearly £5 billion by the end of the decade. But the issue of the lone parent has increasingly been seen as the heart of John Major's Back to Basics crusade. Remember, I think around two, three decades ago, when the Prime Minister of United Kingdom was John Major, there was a kind of ideological campaign to return to morality and so on. and. All the evils of society 
were embodied in the conservative narrative in the figure of a unemployed single mother. Like, there is violence in our suburbs, of course, because single unemployed mothers cannot take care of their, of their children, don't properly educate them, and so on. Uh, uh, we have a lack in our budget, not enough money, of course, we have, we, because we have to support unwed, uh, unwed single mothers, and so on, and so on. In an ideological edifice, you need some pseudo-concrete image like this to fixate your imagination. And then this image can mobilize us. Imagine ideology as a kind of a filter, a frame, so that if you look at the same ordinary reality through that frame, everything changes. In what sense? It's not that the frame actually adds anything. It's just that the frame opens the abyss of suspicion. Freilich wandeln Sie Ihr Äußeres, wenn Sie von der polnischen Niststätte in die reiche Welt hinausgelangen. If we look at the antisemitic image of the Jew, it's crucial to notice how contradictory this figure of the Jew is. Der Relativitätsjude Einstein der seinen deutschen Hass hinter einer obskuren Pseudowissenschaft versteckte. Der Jude Kestenberg betreute im preußischen Kultusministerium die deutsche Musik. Jews are at the same time extra intellectual, like mathematicians, whatever, and vulgar. Auf Deutsch gesagt, die jüdischen Behausungen sind unsauber und verwahrlost. Not washing regularly. Der Jude Schöpflin wurde bei seinem Besuch in Berlin von einer begeisterten Menge begrüßt. Seducing innocent girls all the time and so on and so on. Es lässt sich nicht leugnen, ein Teil des deutschen Volkes applaudierte damals ahnungslos den zugewanderten Juden, den Todfeinden seiner Rasse. Wie war das möglich? Natürlich wissen sich diese Ghetto-Juden zunächst noch nicht richtig in den sauberen europäischen Anzügen zu bewegen. Etwas besser können es diese Berliner Juden. Ihre Väter und Großväter haben zwar auch noch im Ghetto gelebt, aber davon merkt man nun äußerlich nichts mehr. Hier in der zweiten und dritten Generation hat die Assimilation ihren Höhepunkt erreicht. In allen Äußerlichkeiten versuchen sie, es dem Gastvolk gleich zu tun. Und instinktlose Völker lassen sich von dieser Mimikry täuschen und betrachten sie tatsächlich als ihresgleichen. Darin liegt die ungeheure Gefahr. Denn auch diese assimilierten Juden bleiben immer Fremdkörper im Organismus ihres Gastvolkes, so sehr sie ihm äußerlich ähnlich sehen mögen. This is typical for racism. You try to imagine how the other enjoys all the secret orgies or whatever, because in racism the other is not simply an enemy. Usually it is also invested with some specific perverse enjoyment or in an inverted way the other can be someone who tries to steal from us our enjoyment, our to disturb, as we usually put it, our way of life. We should be here very precise, not to fall into the usual trap of disqualifying all elements out of which the Nazi ideological edifice is composed, to disqualify all them as proto-fascist. We should never forget that the large majority of these elements, which we today associate with fascism, were taken from the workers' movement. This idea of large numbers of people marching together, this idea of strict bodily discipline as our duty. The Nazis directly took this over from social democracy, from the left. Let me just take some other central concepts of the Nazi worldview. The solidarity of the people. My God, there is nothing bad in this notion as such. The problem is solidarity to what kind of people? If by people you mean Volksgemeinschaft, the organic community of people, where then the enemy is 
automatically the foreign intruder. In this case, we are in Nazism. The crucial thing is to locate ideology where it belongs. Let's take a clear example. The well-known song, Tomorrow Belongs to Me, from the film Cabaret. The stag in the forest runs free. Some of my friends, after seeing the film, Bob Fosse's Cabaret, thought that after they heard this song, they finally understood what, at its deepest, as to its emotional impact, what fascism is. But I think this precisely is the mistake to be avoided. This song is a rather ordinary, popular song. Incidentally, it was composed while they were shooting the movie by a Jewish couple. Nice irony. If you look not only at the music, at the way it is sung, but even at the words, awakening of a nation, tomorrow belongs to me, one can well imagine with a slight change of words, a radically leftist, communist song. The German hard rock band Rammstein are often accused of flirting, playing with the Nazi militaristic iconography. But if one observes closely their show, one can see very nicely what they are doing. Exemplarily in one of their best known songs, Reise, Reise. The minimal elements of the Nazi ideology enacted by Rammstein are something like pure elements of libidinal investment. Enjoyment has to be, as it were, condensed in some minimal ticks, gestures which do not have any precise ideological meaning. What Rammstein does is it liberates these elements from their Nazi articulation. It allows us to enjoy them in their pre-ideological state. The way to fight Nazism is to enjoy these elements, ridiculous as they may appear, by suspending the Nazi horizon of meaning. This way, you undermine Nazism from within. So how does nonetheless ideology do this? How does it articulate pre-ideological elements? These elements can also be seen as a kind of a bribe, the way ideology pays us to seduce us into its edifice. These bribes can be purely libidinal bribes, all those ticks which are condensed enjoyment, or they can be explicit discursive elements like notions of solidarity, uh, of uh, collective discipline, struggle for one's destiny, and so on and so on. All these in itself are free-floating elements which open themselves to different ideological fields. Let's turn to 
the high point of our consumerism. Let me take a drink. It is still. Some of it, Starbucks coffee. I'm regularly drinking it, I must admit it. But are we aware that when we buy a cappuccino from Starbucks, we also buy quite a lot of ideology? Which ideology? You know, when you enter a Starbucks store, it's usually always displaced in some posters there, their message, which is, yes, our cappuccino is more expensive than others, but, and then comes the story, we give 1% of all our income to some Guatemala children to keep them healthy for the water supply for some Sahara farmers uh, or to, uh, to save the forests, to enable organic growing on coffee, whatever, whatever. Now, I admire the ingenuosity of this solution. In the old days of pure, simple consumerism, you bought a product and then you felt bad. My God, I'm just a consumerist uh, uh, while people are starving in Africa. So the idea was you had to do something to counteract your pure, destructive consumerism. For example, I don't know, you contribute to charity and so on. What Starbucks enables you is to be a consumerist and be a consumerist without any bad conscience because the price for the countermeasure for fighting consumerism is already included into the price of a commodity. Like you pay a little bit more and you are not just a consumerist, but you do also your duty towards environment, uh, the poor, starving uh, people in Africa, and so on and so on. It's, I think, the ultimate form of consumerism. We should not simply oppose a principal life dedicated to duty and enjoying our small pleasures. Let's take today's capitalism. We have, on the one hand, the demands of the circulation of the capital, which push us towards profit-making, expansion, uh, exploitation and destruction of nature, and on the other hand, ecological demands. Let's think about our posterity and about our own survival. Let's take care of nature and so on. In this opposition between ruthless pursuit of capitalist expansion and ecological awareness, Duty, a strange perverted duty, of course. Duty is on the side of capitalism. As many perspicuous analysts noted, capitalism has a strange religious structure. It is propelled by this absolute demand. Capital has to circulate, to reproduce itself, to expand, to multiply itself. And for this goal, anything can be sacrificed, up to our lives, up to nature, and so on. Here we have a strange, unconditional injunction. And a true capitalist is a miser who is ready to sacrifice everything for this perverted duty. What we see here in Mojave Desert at this resting place for abandoned plains is the other side of capitalist dynamics. Capitalism is all the time in crisis. This is precisely why it appears almost indestructible. Crisis is not its obstacle. It is what pushes it forwards towards permanent self-revolutionizing permanent, extended self-reproduction. Always new products. The other invisible side of it is waste. Tremendous amount of waste. We shouldn't react to these heaps of waste by trying to somehow get rid of it. Maybe the first thing to do is to accept this waste to accept that there are things out there which serve nothing.
to break out of this eternal cycle of functioning. The German philosopher Walter Benjamin said something very deep. He said that we experience history. What does it mean for us to be historical beings? Not where, when we are engaged in things, when things move. Only when we see this, again, rest, waste of culture, being half retaken by nature, at that point we get an intuition of what history means. Maybe this also accounts for the redemptive value of post-catastrophic movies, like I am legend and so on. We see the devastated human environment, half-empty factories, machines falling apart, half-empty stores. What we experience at this moment, the psychoanalytic term for it would have been the inertia of the real this mute presence beyond meaning. What moments like confronting planes here in Mojave Desert bring to us is maybe a chance for an authentic passive experience. Maybe without this properly artistic moment of authentic passivity, nothing new can emerge. Maybe something new only emerges through the failure, the suspension of proper functioning of the existing network, of our life world, where we are. Maybe this is what we need more than ever today. What does the wreck of the Titanic stand for? We all know the standard reading of the impact of the sinking of the Titanic. Not only the film, but the real accident. This sinking had such an impact because it happened in a society at that point, still in all its glitz and glory, unaware of the decay that awaited it in the near future, the world wars and so on. But there is something in excess of this entire field of meanings, which is the very fascinating presence of the ruin of the Titanic. And we hear the line of Celia Johnson's thought. I wish I could trust you. I wish you were a wise, kind friend. Instead of a gossiping acquaintance I've known casually for years and never particularly cared for. What is the nature of this deadlock of Celia Johnson? She is split between the two figures in the film of The Big Other. On the one hand, it's her husband, the ideal listener, but it's out of question to confess to him. Dear Fred, there's so much that I want to say to you. You're the only one in the world with enough wisdom and gentleness to understand. <laughs> Wild horses wouldn't drag me away from England and home and all the things I'm used to. I mean, one has one's roots, after all, hasn't one? Oh, yes, one has one's roots. On the other hand, you have here this stupid person who is available as a confessor, but there is not even an elementary trust. I wish you'd stop talking. I wish you'd stop prying and trying to find things out. I wish you were dead. No, I don't mean that. That was silly and unkind. But I wish you'd stop talking. My dear, all her hair came out, and she said the social life was quite, quite horrid. Provincial, you know, and very nouveau riche. Oh, Dolly. What's the matter, dear? Are you feeling ill again? So that's the tragedy of our predicament. In order to fully exist as individuals, we need the fiction of a big other. There must be an agency which, as it were, registers our predicament, an agency where 
the truth of ourselves will be inscribed, accepted, an agency to which to confess. But what if there is no such agency? This was the utmost despair of many women raped in the post-Yugoslav war in Bosnia in the early 90s. They survived their terrible predicament, and what kept them alive was the idea, I must survive to tell the truth. If, when, if they survived, they made a terrible discovery. There is no one really to listen to them, either some totally ignorant bored social worker or some relative who usually made obscene insinuations like, are you sure you were not even enjoying a little bit the rape and so on and so on. They discovered the truth of what Jacques Lacan claims. There is no big other. There may be a virtual big other to whom you cannot confess. There may be a real other, but it's never the virtual one. We are alone. I think Kafka was right when he said that for a modern, secular, non-religious man, bureaucracy, state bureaucracy, is the only remaining contact with the dimension of the divine. It is in this scene from Brazil that we see the intimate link between bureaucracy and enjoyment. What the impenetrable omnipotence of bureaucracy harbors is divine enjoyment. Carpus Terror is the restless victim. Mr. Warren. Yes. No. Definitely no. My name's Larry, Mr. Warren. Sam Larry. The intense rush of bureaucratic engagement serves nothing. It is the performance of its very purposelessness that generates an intense enjoyment ready to reproduce itself forever. Between you and me, Larry, this no, no department, tell records to get stuff, is about to be upgraded and... Ah! Here we are, your very own number on your very own door. And behind that door, your very own office. Congratulations, DZ stroke 015. Welcome to the team. Yes, no, cancel that. Send two copies to find out. The obverse of this is a wonderful scene more towards the beginning of the film. Harry Tuttle, heating engineer at your service. The hero who has a problem in his apartment with plumbing tries to get the state agency to fix it. Are you from Central Services? <laughs> Of course, two guys come, they just want forms to fill in, they do nothing. I call Central Services. And then the ultimate subversive figure comes. A kind of clandestine plumberer, played by Robert De Niro. Just a minute. What was that business with the gun? Just a precaution, sir. Just a precaution. Who tells him, just tell me what is the problem, and promises quickly to fix it. This, of course, is the ultimate offense to bureaucracy. Are you telling me that this is illegal? <laughs> Thanks. Listen, Chin, we're all in it together. In the ordinary theological universe, your duty is imposed onto you by God or society, another higher authority, and your responsibility is to do it. But in a radically atheist universe, you are not only responsible for doing your duty, you are also responsible for deciding what is your duty. There is always in our subjectivity, in the way we experience ourselves, a minimum of hysteria. Hysteria is what? Hysteria is the way we question our social symbolic identity. You're sure it's God? You're sure it's not the devil? I'm not sure. I'm not sure of anything. If it's the devil, the devil can be cast out. But what if it's God? We 
can't cast out God, can you? What is hysteria at its most elementary? It's a question addressed at the authority which defines my identity. It's why am I what you are telling me that I am? In psychoanalytic theory, hysteria is much more subversive than perversion. A pervert has no uncertainties, while, again, the hysterical position is that of a doubt, which is an extremely productive position. All new inventions come from hysterical questioning. And the unique character of Christianity is that it transposes this hysterical questioning onto God himself as a subject. Who's that? Who's following me? Is that you? This is the ingenious idea of the last temptation of Christ. Kazantaki's uh, novel and Scorsese's film. Namely, the idea that when Jesus Christ in his youth is told that he is not only the son of God, but basically God himself, he doesn't simply accept it. This is, for Jesus Christ, boy, traumatic news, like, my God, why am I dead? Am I really dead? How did we come to that unique point, which I think makes Christianity an exception? It all began with the book of Job. As we all know, things turned out bad for Job. He loses everything his house, his family, his possessions, and so on. Three friends visit him, and each of them tries to justify Job's misfortunes. The greatness of Job is that he does not accept this deeper meaning. When, towards the end of the book of Job, God himself appears, God gives right to Job. He says everything that the theological friends were telling Job is false, everything Job was saying is true. No meaning in catastrophes. Here we have the first step in the direction of delegitimizing suffering. Father, stay with me. Don't leave me. The contrast between Judaism and Christianity is the contrast between anxiety and love. The idea is that the Jewish God is the God of the abyss of the other's desire. Terrible things happen. God is in charge, but we do not know what the big other God wants from us, what is the divine desire. To designate this traumatic experience, Lacan used the Italian phrase, che vuoi? What do you want? This terrifying question, but what do you want from me? The idea is that Judaism persists in this anxiety, like God remains this enigmatic, terrifying other. And then Christianity resolves the tension through love. By sacrificing his son, God demonstrates that he loves us. So it's a kind of a imaginary, sentimental even, resolution of a situation of radical anxiety. If this were to be the case, then Christianity would have been kind of ideological reversal or pacification of the deep, much more shattering Jewish insight. But I think one can read the Christian gesture in a much more 
radical way. This is what the sequence of crucifixion in Scorsese's film shows us. What dies on the cross is precisely this guarantee of the big other. The message of Christianity is here radically atheist. It's the death of Christ is not any kind of redemption or commercial affair in the sense of Christ suffers to pay for our sins, pay to whom, for what, and so on. It's simply the disintegration of the God which guarantees the meaning of our lives. And that's the meaning of that famous phrase, Eli Eli Lama Sabakami, Father, why have you forsaken me? Just before Christ's death, we get what in psychoanalytic terms we call subjective destitution. Stepping out totally of the domain of symbolic identification. Cancelling or suspending the entire field of symbolic authority, the entire field of the big other. Of course, we cannot know what God wants from us because there is no God. This is the Jesus Christ who says, among other things, I bring sword, not peace. If you don't hate your father, your mother, you are not my follower. Of course, this doesn't mean that you should actively hate or kill your parents. I think that Family relations stand here for hierarchic social relations. The message of Christ is, I'm dying, but my death itself is good news. It means you are alone, left to your freedom, be in the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, which is just the community of believers. It's wrong to think that the second coming will be that Christ as a figure will return somehow. Christ is already here when believers form an emancipatory collective. This is why I claim that the only way really to be an atheist is to go through Christianity. Christianity is much more atheist than the usual atheism, which can claim there is no God and so on, but nonetheless, it retains a certain trust into the big other. This big other can be called natural necessity, evolution, or whatever. We humans are nonetheless reduced to a position within a harmonious whole of evolution, whatever. But the difficult thing to accept is, again, that there is no big other, no point of reference which guarantees meaning. We are in John Frankenheimer's Seconds, a neglected Hollywood masterpiece from 1966, from the very heart of the hippie era, which preached unrestrained hedonism, realize your dreams, enjoy life fully. The film is the story of a late middle-aged businessman leading a gray, totally alienated life, and then he decides at some point that he has enough of it. Through one of his friends, he contacts a mysterious agency which offers him a deal. They will reorganize his life so that he will be reborn. The cost runs in the neighborhood of $30,000. I know the seems rather high, but in addition to the rather extensive cosmetic renovation by way of plastic surgery for you, CPS has to provide a fresh corpse that perfectly matches uh, your physical dimensions and medical specifications. 
CPS? Oh, cadaver procurement section. They use some corpse. They change it to look like his own body. They plant this corpse, stage a pseudo accident so that police thinks he is dead. You know, Mr. Wilson, you represent something of a milestone around here. And then the agency organizes an alternate life. In a nice villa somewhere around LA, they even organize a nice lady who conveniently stumbles upon him when he is taking a walk along the beach. Hello. He is thus reborn. I'm Norma. No longer as a boring businessman, but as a modernist I'm painter. Tony Wilson. Called Tony Wilson. Played by none other than Rock what? Hudson. Sure. So the woman, Nora, his new love, tries to engage him in life, even takes him to some uh, wine orgy where people get drunk, dance, naked, and so on. Everything seems okay. But Tony Wilson starts to miss his old life. More and more, he is haunted by his past. Finally, he breaks down, approaches again the agency, telling them that he wants to return to his old life. The boss of this mysterious company, a kind of kindly, cruel... Hello, son. ...superego paternal figure, tells him the truth. He disappointed them by not being able to adapt himself to his new life, uh, you know, I sure hoped you'd make it. Find your dream come true. What? I said I sure hoped that you'd make it. Find your dream come true. <laughs> oh, you can call it wishful thinking, son. But life is built on wishes. And you gotta just keep plugging away at them. You can't give up. And you can't let the mistakes jeopardize the dream. So what went wrong here? The problem was that his past in its material existence was erased. Well, here's your transportation. What? Surgery, sir. He lived in a totally new environs, new job, uh, uh, new friends, and so on. What remained the same were his dreams. Because when the company organized his rebirth, when the company provided new existence for him, they simply followed his dreams. His dreams were wrong dreams. And this is quite a deep lesson for the theory of ideology. Just remember, son, we got to keep plugging away at the dream. The mistakes teach us how. It wasn't wasted. Remember that. On the way to the operation hall, he discovers the horrible truth. He will not be reborn, but he will be used as a cadaver for another person who wants to be reborn. We should draw a line of distinction within the very field of our dreams. So keep it until life Between those who are the right dreams, pointing towards a dimension effectively beyond our existing society and the wrong dreams. The dreams which are just an idealized, consumerist reflection, mirror image of our society. We are not simply submitted to our dreams. They just come from some unfathomable depths and we can't do anything about it. This is the basic lesson of psychoanalysis and fiction cinema. We are responsible for our dreams. Our dreams stage our desires, and our desires are not objective facts. We created them, we sustain them, we are responsible for them. This is an area of ancient lake beds deposited five to 10 million years ago. The scene of mass orgy in Zabriski Point is a nice metaphor of what went wrong with the 1960s hippie revolution. 
It's crucial that Zabriski Point was made in 1970 when the authentic revolutionary energy of the 60s was already losing its strength. This orgy is somewhere between subversion of the existing social order and already the full aestheticized reincorporation of these allegedly transgressive activities into the hegemonic ideology. Although Antonioni meant this as a kind of transcendence of the existing constraints, we can easily imagine this shot in some publicity campaign. The first step to freedom is not just to change reality to fit your dreams. It's to change the way you dream. And again, this hurts, because all satisfactions we have come from our dreams. The great Supreme Commander, Chairman Mao, issued a world-shaking call to us. You should pay attention to state affairs and carry the great proletarian cultural revolution through to the end. One of the big problems of all great revolutionary movements of the 20th century, such as Russia, Cuba, or China, is that they did change the social body, but the egalitarian communist society was never realized. The dreams remained the old dreams, and they turned into the ultimate nightmare. Now, what remains of the radical left waits for a magical event when the true revolutionary agent will finally awaken. While the depressing lesson of the last decades is that capitalism has been the true revolutionizing force, even as it serves only itself. How come it is easier for us to imagine the end of all life on Earth an asteroid hitting the planet, then a modest change in our economic order. Perhaps the time has come to set our possibilities straight and to become realists by way of demanding what appears as impossible in the economic domain. The surprising explosion of Occupy Wall Street protests, the mass mobilization in Greece, the crowds on Tahrir Square, they all bear witness to the hidden potential for a different future. There is no guarantee that this future will arrive. No train of history on which we simply have to take a ride. It depends on us, on our will. In revolutionary upheavals, some energy or rather some utopian dreams take place, they explode, and even if the actual result of a social upheaval is just a commercialized uh, everyday life, this excess of energy, what's get, what gets lost in the result, persists, not in reality, but as a dream haunting us, waiting to be redeemed. In this sense, whenever we are engaged in radical emancipatory politics, we should never forget, as Walter Benjamin put it almost a century ago, that every revolution is not only, if it is an authentic revolution, is not only directed towards the future, but it redeems also the past failed revolutions. All the ghosts, as if were the living dead of the past revolution, which are roaming around unsatisfied, will finally find their home in the new freedom.
I may be freezing to death, but you will never get rid of me. All the ice in the world cannot kill a true idea. <laughs>